So differences between um, Lutheranism and Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, I've gotten quite a few questions about this. I, I constantly get questions about this. People ask, have you ever addressed Eastern Orthodoxy? I, I do have programs where I've, I've spent the entire hour on Eastern Orthodoxy. So um, if, if you just Google my name and Eastern Orthodoxy, um, Google is your friend with these kinds of things, you will find resources out there. Um, so the reason I think people ask me about Eastern Orthodoxy is because of my book, Christification, A Lutheran Approach to Theosis. So I, so I have done quite a bit of reading on, on Eastern Orthodoxy, particularly on the doctrine of, of theosis. It's something I'm very interested in. Um, it's something that I think is valuable, the teaching of theosis. Um, I think it's something that is found basically in the entirety of the Christian tradition, not just in the Eastern Church from the patristic era, um, even through the Middle Ages, and I think there's a strong strain of it actually in within the Lutheran Reformation. Um, I can't speak to the Reformed tradition on that issue. I don't know historically what some of the sources are, or how they've dealt with that issue, um, but but there definitely is a strong strand of, of a real um, kind of mystical idea of union with Christ. We call it mystical union. Now that I know that term mystical is thrown around a lot and means lots of different things to lots of different people, and there certainly is a kind of mysticism that's very bad. Um, what, what Luther refers to as, as enthusiasm. Um, but in terms of there being a real participation of us in God himself, and, and there's a participation of us in specifically in Christ, um, that language is, is very thoroughly Christian, and it's in Luther all over the place. It's in Gerhard all over the place. Gerhard speaks about uh, humans becoming divine. Uh, we partake of a divine feast, and we become divine men as we partake of the Eucharist. Um, that, that kind of language shows up a lot in, in Gerhard. You find some of it in Chemnitz um, and, and in Luther and in, in other writers in the Lutheran tradition as well, um, especially if you look at Gerhard's devotional works. That, that's where you'll find this theosis language just all over the place. It's, it's very, very prominent. Um, in Martin Chemnitz, he, he cites um, you know, Athanasius. He cites um, many of the Eastern Fathers um, with you know, uh, Basil and, and Gregory and all sorts of other individuals. Um, specifically dealing with those those topics um, of, of theosis and he, and he does so approvingly um, so uh, there are definitely areas of overlap in in, in that way um, but i was asked a question you know does eastern orthodoxy then differ from lutheranism in terms of of adherence to things like divine simplicity and uh, some other notions so let me look at each of those um, so the question essentially comes down to in some ways is is lutheranism specifically a western church or is it also an eastern church um, and there are incarnations of lutheranism that use an eastern rite liturgy in, in some eastern countries um, so it, i don't think in lutheranism itself inherently has to be western i don't think it's inherently tied to you know western liturgical forms and that it can't adapt to, to eastern liturgical forms um, but at the same time, Lutheranism did come out of the Western Church. I mean, that, that's historically just the case. There, there were discussions between Lutheranism and Eastern Orthodoxy uh, after the Reformation, but nothing really came of them. Uh, Luther did use the, the Orthodox Church, even as well, as well as the Coptic Church, pointing to the Ethiopians, um, as examples of how the Church had not been corrupted by the papacy everywhere. And so because of that, there certainly was always a kind of admiration for the Eastern Church within Lutheranism uh, in the sense that this was here was a church that existed without the, the corruptions of the papacy and some of the other corruptions within the medieval church. However, Lutheranism still is a Western church. We come out of the Western Catholic tradition. And so because of that, uh, there are things that we hold to that are distinctively Western. So one of the questions um, that, that was asked was, um, are Lutherans required to, the whole to, to hold to the filioque? And, and the answer is yes, um, because our, our foundational documents, uh, our Book of Concord has the, the foundational uh, three ecumenical creeds, uh, which include the Apostles, Nicene, and Athanasian creeds. Uh, and those are Western creeds, Western versions of those creeds. The Athanasian creed does not have a particular strong stance in the Eastern Church. Um, so we are absolutely a Western church. And yes, we hold to uh, the filioque as, as teaching that is that is correct. So uh, while there are areas of overlap between Lutheranism and Eastern Orthodoxy on certain things, um, that's one of the things that Lutheranism has always held to. Um, you know, an, another question in terms of the relationship between the two is the use of, of unleavened bread. Um, you know, the, our confessions don't really ever address the issue of leavened versus unleavened bread. 
because we're a Western church, we've used um, unleavened bread. I, I'm not aware of, of a particular reason why that would be a kind of a, a deal-breaking issue of in terms of, like, I, I don't know if it would be unconfessional to use leavened bread. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I'd have to think, I guess, a little more about that and look into some of the early Lutheran fathers to see whether they even really thought about that issue because I don't really think, I, I can't think of it even ever being addressed. Um, and someone might know better than I do, maybe can point me to a place where that specific idea um, was addressed somewhere in Chemnitz or Luther or, or something, I don't know. Um, so the other question then is is veneration. So veneration of, of saints, veneration of icons. Um, now the word veneration itself ha has always been kind of a, a difficult one um, because people mean a lot of different things by using the term veneration. It has certain implications, I think, for some that it probably doesn't have for others. So you've got to explain your terms and ask what you mean in terms of, of veneration. So um, speaking, uh, if you're speaking about icons specifically, it is common that, um, you know, Lutheran Christians will have iconography. Um, I have icons. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, this icon here, this is actually, um, was hand-painted in Greece. It's a beautiful uh, icon of Christ that I have here. Um, so, you know, I do have iconography around my, my office, and a lot of Lutherans do. Um, but but I th our theology of iconography is going to be different in that we see them as, as helpful full tools and reminders of Christ uh, and, and what he's done for us. Um, but we don't believe them to be, you know, windows to heaven, as the Eastern Church would. Um, and, and simply holding to sola scriptura, you can't, because it's not something that is taught in scripture. It's, it's just not. Um, it's something that you, you have to hold to tradition as, as an authority to do that. Now, e even there, I would say Lutherans do hold, in some sense, to tradition as an authority. It's just not a God-breathed authority that has the same uh, level of authority as scripture does. So it always has to be judged by scripture, which is the the ultimate norming authority. It, it's the only thing that is that is God breathed, that is theonoustos, um, given to us directly by the inspiration of God. So we can't, you know, add doctrines and teachings apart from that. Though tradition certainly is is a guide and an authority for us, subsumed under Scripture. So uh, with all that being said, yeah, we wouldn't hold to uh, the veneration of icons in the sense that the Eastern Orthodox do. Um, I, I don't see scriptural grounds for that. What I do see scriptural grounds for is, um, you know, imagery being used in worship and art being used to promote worship. And we see that just in the creation of the cherubim in the Old Testament. Um, and a lot of early Christians did uh, have images in, in their sanctuaries. Not all of them, though, because there, there are some, you know, the Council of Toledo, and I can't give you the exact date, it was third century, um, for example, said that uh, there were to be no images in worship. So there were some early Christians that didn't have images at all in, in worship. Um, but we have examples of images that were there as well. So, so we couldn't say the practice of having images was universal, nor could we say that every Christian was opposed to having it. It seems to be, to be kind of a regional issue in terms of some have them, some don't. Um, so, so we wouldn't see the same kind of necessity in them um, as the Eastern Church does. We think they can be helpful. Uh, but in terms of veneration, um, they're, they're not sacred things in the sense that, you know, the sacraments are, because the sacraments are ordained by Christ, um, and, and images simply aren't. Um, so we do things like um, bow in a service before the altar. Um, that's probably the closest thing to any kind of act of veneration that, that you'll see in a Lutheran Mass. Um, and the bowing before the altar, because I've, I've had people ask, actually a lot you know why do you do that are you saying that the altar is you know the wood in the altar is holy or what, what's what's going on it, it's really a reverence for christ himself because christ is the one who is present on the altar and he's present in the altar uh on the altar through the elements of, of bread and wine as he gives us his body and blood so there's a kind of reverence respect that we have um but in terms of veneration of images i wouldn't you certainly wouldn't use that language but there is there are some differences even among earlier lutherans on how we understand the Seventh Ecumenical Council. So if you look at Martin Chemnitz and his treatment of, of the subject in his examination of the Council of Trent, he's pretty harsh about the Seventh Ecumenical Council um, because of what he, what he calls image worship and, and the kind of uh, view of images that's promoted there. So that would be a big difference between us and the East. 
Um, but there were other Lutherans who were not quite as harsh about the Seventh Ecumenical Council um, either. So there is a little bit of wiggle room in, in those questions in terms of where Lutherans fall. But, but overall, yeah, there are some areas where we're going to have similarities with the Eastern Church. Um, some people I know have referred to Lutheranism as the Western Orthodox Church. Um, I, I don't think that's accurate, really. I mean, I think there, there are similarities. We've always liked the Eastern Fathers. In terms of our Christology, we're closer to, to the East. Um, Chemnitz love the Eastern Fathers. Melanchthon love the Eastern Fathers. Um, but at the same time, there are some very distinctive Eastern teachings that we certainly don't hold to. And the East is definitely going to be in opposition to our, our approach to forensic justification, um, our, our approach to the bondage of the will. And, and those really are some kind of insurmountable issues. So um, while I think it's good to be in dialogue with the East and, and recognize the similarities, there still are some pretty important points of division between the two traditions.